So for the moon or Mars, the most logical thing to grow plants in is, of course, the regolith. You want to be able to have grow your own food. I mean, if there's an alien civilization, they may be price gougers. You know, you can make you, right? you want to you want to protect against inflation. Well, how are you gonna <laughs> you can't haggle with an alien? This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. And I got with me as a co-host, Paul Mercurio. Paul, dude. How did you get to see you, my man? A bit too long. Oh, yeah, man. I know, I know. I know. We're yeah. going to get together for lunch again soon. Yeah, we'll do it. The, we'll do it. With our, with our buddy. Stand-up comedian. And I just love the fact that uh, every time I'm on Colbert, you're there warming up the crowd before anything else happens. So that's why they're laughing and they're always in a good mood. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> or if they're not, it's my fault. <laughs> I and, forgot I could blame you as yeah. well. For or you that. get like, why were they so excited but not laughing enough? Why weren't they laughing? Why were they not? <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. Nice. So today's it. subject is something I've been, it's been eating away at me because I've been thinking about it ever since I've been thinking about it. All right. And it's like, can you grow plants on other planets? Right. I mean, we think of putting seeds in the ground and then it grows and all you need is a little bit of water and a little bit of sunlight. And nobody's thinking about what role the soil is playing. I mean, no, I mean, regular people aren't thinking this, of course. Uh, experts think about it all the time. And so there's a word they use for the, the, the quote, soils of the moon. It's called the regolith, right? It's a geology term. And we'll learn more about that in a minute. So, so this whole show is going to be, if we're going to go to another planet, either our moon or Mars or wherever, and we're going to feed ourselves without having, you know, supply chains uh, keep us alive, then, <laughs> then, like, what do you do and how do you do it? And I have no such expertise in this. So we combed the world and we found two people <laughs> who, <laughs> who this is what they do. Uh, let me first introduce Annalisa Paul. Annalisa, welcome to Star Talk. Thank you. So happy to be here. Excellent. So you're the director at the Interdisciplinary Center for Biotechnology and a, and a researcher at the University of Florida, okay? And a research professor at Horticultural Studies, right? Horticultural Sciences, yep. Oh, no, no, uh, horticultural Sciences, very good. And so you think about your plant, you you've had a green thumb from early on. Is this what we're telling us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 kind of. But I also would describe myself as you know, simple country molecular biologist. There you go. I love it. I a country molecular biologist. We need more of those. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Just got a quick question. How good are your tomato plants at home? Are they good or are they? <laughs> That's the litmus test because if, <laughs> if you got crappy tomatoes, we're, we're, we're finding another guest. We've done some research and we have photos that are. I just That's said, right. No. But my Arabidopsis craft, craft is um, pretty good. <laughs> All right, we'll, Brilliant. We'll, we'll get top people worth looking into that. And we've got uh, with us also uh, one of your collaborators in this effort, uh, Robert Furl, professor and VP of research in horticulture. Is that, Am I saying that right, Robert? I'm, I'm vice president for research at the University of Florida. There it goes. Thank you. And you're with a special, you happen to have an academic specialty of horticulture, but if you're a VP of research, you're overseeing all the research in the science there, correct? Well, I have a role in enabling the research overall at the University of Florida. That is so politely, tactfully it. said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You don't want to make any enemies just by how I describe what you do. Uh, yeah. Very good. And you, um, I have here your uh, interests are uh, environmental regulation of gene activity in plants. So I love this combination of expertise because... It's not just, let's find a seed on Earth and then grow it somewhere else. You might have to do some serious gene editing to make that happen. So uh, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to sort of jump into this. And so could, could, could one of you just start us off and tell me, um, do we have experience trying to grow things on moon soil? Did the Apollo astronauts, I know they brought back rocks, but did they bring back bags of soil too? Yeah, so you're talking on one of the really interesting parts of sort of Apollo history that drew us into this business. We're, we're space biologists. We're very used to sending experiments to the International Space Station and understanding the role of gravity in terrestrial biology. And in fact, trying to think about how we would feed in astronauts as they're 
as they're traveling between planetary bodies um, in our solar system. But it turns out that this whole notion of, of whether plants, whether biology interacts with lunar samples is one of a pretty deep historical note. Um, the Apollo astronauts, to answer your question, they sure did bring back lunar dirt. They brought back all kinds of rocks. They brought back all kinds of samples of the dust and the dirt that was in and around their sampling sites. But so, so Paul, you notice he can't call it soil. Notice that. Yes. He's got, yes. He's, he just used four different adjectives for it. I know. I know. And all I'm thinking about dirt is like they somebody had it on their boots when they walked into the laboratory and you just started screaming, hello, is someone, that's why we have a mat at the door. You're an astronaut. You can't figure that out. Until biology touches it. It really can't be called soil. So, all right, all right. So we it, have, we have because of our work, we actually have lunar dirt, lunar soil in our laboratory now because it's been in contact with biology. Um, so to, to round out your question about dirt, yep, um, Apollo astronauts did bring soil, did bring dirt back from the moon. They kept it. They, NASA, they, the lunar sample curators and the lunar sample community kept it under tight wraps at Johnson Space Center for the purposes of, of studying lunar geology primarily. But it's one of the great untold stories, unremembered stories, underappreciated stories of the Apollo era is the role that biology played, including plant biology in determining right. that the samples that came back from the moon were not dangerous, did not have lunar pathogens. Okay, lunar so let me ask you, Annalisa, if, if, if we know in advance that it's not Earth soil, and whatever it is, if, if um, by the way, I'm glad somebody, uh, your, 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 your professional brethren from a previous generation, did decide that there was no bug that was brought back from the moon. Uh, you may remember the novel, The Andromeda Strain, which oh, yeah. came, came out right <laughs> around that time, which was a bug from space that totally wreaked havoc. And of course, I, it, I think that was Michael Crichton's first novel before he wrote Jurassic Park and a whole lot of other things. So he had some good sort of bio chops to, to give us uh, fun thrillers. But, but Annalisa, if we already know there's nothing living, or we suspected and confirmed, nothing living in the soil, then isn't it challenge to grow plants in something that doesn't have living organisms and who cares if it's regolith or anything else well so there's a lot of there's two two layers of stuff there first of all they never grew plants in it even back in the apollo days all they ever did was a, a scientist biologist called charles walkinshaw just sort of rubbed the surfaces of the leaves you know sprinkled on the surface just to see if there are any pathogens or anything but nobody ever grew, actually grew it in the dirt, in the in the regolith, to see if it would actually support plant growth and development. So we had no idea whether there wouldn't be something toxic to plants or something too reactive to plants that would able to support it. So if you if you're going to go someplace else, you have to be able to have plants as part of the equation to support long term goals. You have to have plants to recycle your air, root water, in addition to providing food. And the best way to do that is if you can use in situ resources, something that's already there, so you don't have to carry it with you. So for the moon or Mars, the most logical thing to grow plants in is, of course, the regolith. Yeah, and you and you want to be able to you want to be able to have grow your own food. I mean, if there's an alien civilization, they may be price gougers. You know, you can make right, right, you right? want to you want to protect against inflation. Well, how are you going to? You can't haggle with an alien. They, you, you're you're two thousand light years away from home. You don't have any leverage. So whatever they're going to charge you. So you want to have. But, your but own just to be food. clear, Paul, well, the moon is one third of a light second. From, no, okay. No, no, this is where no. you don't have to be so smart and correct me. Just go along with no, it. Okay? No, one, one and a half light seconds. Sorry, I got okay. the wrong number there. Um, no, but but if so, I hadn't. Consider that, of course, it's not whether there are microbes that could help it, but whether there's something that would actively destroy it. That would be that right. would be bad too. All right, very good. Right. Okay. Right. And and NASA, if, correct me if I'm wrong. Does I remember this 20 years ago? Do they still have a a a a, a branch of themselves called that specializes in in situ resource utilization? ISRU. Yep. Okay. Yep, absolutely. 
And wh why did it, um, it was 50 years, right? With, uh, I had, that before the, act, you actively started trying to grow things in, in the regular, why, why was there such a long period of time, or if I'm off on that a little bit, it was a long period of time before you started trying to grow things in the soil. Why, why was that? I mean, Neil Armstrong had to be upset because he, he must have been calling like every other week going, <laughs> Hey, you know all that dirt I brought back? Are you guys using it? For anything? Because uh, I for... sort of took up a lot of space for Tang on the ship, and I, uh, <laughs> but I was willing. To... Is there a reason that you guys, it, it took a while to start to use some of that? Well, there, there are several reasons, and, and many of them are, I think, tied up with the simple fact that until the collective we decided to go back to the moon with the Artemis program, those lunar soil samples that were at Johnson Space Center kept under nitrogen and controlled conditions were the only ones that we were gonna have. And so they were very, very careful. NASA was very, very careful with how much and what kinds of samples they put out to the, to the community to study. And by and large, the questions that needed to be answered was, things associated with the age of the moon and the geology of the moon. Biology going to the moon, interacting with the moon was it's not down the road. It's important. It's right. down the road. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Annalisa, tell me about the Florida Space Plants Lab. Like, what do you guys well, do? Well, so it's uh, directed by Rob and myself, and we do mostly what you think of as orbital science. Um, so we do a lot of plants to the space station and ask the very simple question is how do plants respond at the molecular level to the novel environment of space flight? So we look at patterns of gene expression and things, what molecular tools plants are pulling out of their toolbox. But we also do what we call sort of exploration science and suborbital science so we can test what kind of uh, things we can learn about plants in any of these kind of environments that we may face ourselves with in the future. Right. So the, the environment, just to be, be clear. Um, Rob, when I think of the space environment, of course, as an astrophysicist, you're in zero G, but you're, there's also a uh, high energy flux of particles from the sun that could affect DNA, I suppose. I know at low Earth orbit, we're a little bit insulated from that, but um, in terms of, quote, space environment, it seems to me it's, it's more than just a zero G proposition, correct? Oh, absolutely. And um, much like the previous question about lunar soil samples, most of our space biology research for the last 20 years has been in low Earth orbit. The opportunities to study biology beyond the Van Allen belts, biology on the moon or biology in deep space, um, basically didn't exist. It wasn't an option. And so to drive back to the question, many, many of our scientific questions are about what happens in microgravity and the absence of unit gravity here on Earth. That's something that's been a driving evolutionary presence for all of biology forever. Um, but again, going back to the moon now opens up sort of the intellectual floodgates. And we do have to come to grips with the question, what happens to biology when it's not protected by a magnetic field. So absolutely, solar right. flux is an important thing. Are there layers here? In other words, once you establish, you can grow something in the regolith. Like, so you have to factor in cosmic rays, solar winds, and, and how you can, and the substrates. And how do you, have you started to look at, I guess what Neil was referring to as the environment and the effects on the regolith, if you're going to do this going forward, or is that farther down the road to try to figure some of that out? So there's a couple layers of questions there as well. Uh, really? First of all, wow, I'm pretty smart. I mean, <laughs> tons of layers, like an onion. <laughs> so, but if you think about anything- I, I love that. The horticulturist the says it's layers <laughs> like an onion. You got food references to yeah. everything here. Okay. I, I was thinking more of Shrek, actually, but yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but- but you have a, you're going to be growing in a habitat, so you're not going to worry so much about things like um, the solar wind, because you're going to be as protected. The plants will be as protected as the humans inside a habitat. However, the solar wind does affect the regolith itself from before you've collected it, and mm. that's one of the things that we found in the work that Rob and I did is that the older regolith stuff that's been exposed to the solar wind longer is actually more um, 
hostile to plant growth than the quote younger. We're talking a billion years younger regolith of other sites. Interesting. And of course, the solar wind just embeds in the surface of the moon and it just stays there. It doesn't erode. It doesn't wash away right. with the streams. So you've got quite the record there. And just to make sure, because Rob mentioned the Van Allen Belt, I want to make sure we're all on the same page here. The, um, but I hadn't heard reference to the Van Allen Belt in decades. So thanks for bringing that up again. <laughs> um, so the, the, the Earth has these sort of magnetic zones that can actually trap particles and prevent them from coming lower and funnel them to the poles and give us the aurora borealis, this sort of thing. And so if you are orbiting within that, you're basically protected. But once you go beyond that, you don't have these repositories, these protective layers and zones, to, uh, protective because it otherwise would be hostile to life as we know it. So yeah, thanks for that bit of memory lane there. Well, I got to tell you, this is going to be great for me because I, you know, trying to grow something in harsh conditions, it, I'm going to give you an ex my situation. If you, I mean, it's similar to me. I can't grow a philodendron. I guess I keep freaking watering it and um, my watering process is terrible. So if you can help me with the harsh conditions that I put my plants under, I think we'd be in a Paul Mercurio shape. proof plants. That's what they're, <laughs> they're going to put that ahead of the space plants, Paul. Okay. Please, please. We'll I, I feel end. like I'm a common man and they, we all have the same problem. <laughs> if someone could just remind me to put some uh, water on the plants, but, um, but yeah, the, so yeah. We're going to take a break and when we come back, we'll get uh, deeper into what kinds of seeds are being used and what kind of modifications to them are necessary and what kind of food is produced. Because I hope it's going to be something other than kale. Okay, because <laughs> I, I ain't going into space, <laughs> yeah. all right? So I got nothing against kale, right. but... But if you blanch it, it's fine. No, it's not. No, it's always bad. So yeah. uh, we'll, we'll be right back. We're talking about growing food in space on Star Talk. We're back, Star Talk. We're talking about growing plants not only in space, but in destinations in space, such as the moon and perhaps Mars and beyond. And you can't just plant the seeds. You got it. You need a little more than that. And I've got with me two experts, two, two, uh, two folks who are colleagues at the University of Florida who are horticulturists with special interest in, in biotechnology and, and show not quite astrobiology. We have, that would be life forms that develop somewhere else. We're talking about developing Earth life elsewhere. And both of them are totally into this, published papers together on it. And that's why we got them both here for this program. And I got with me, of course, Paul Mercurio to help me out. And so let me just ask you guys, what, um, what studies have you done with what seeds? And why did you choose those seeds instead of others? And what's the, what's the thinking behind your experiments? All right, that, that's an easy one. So we mostly work with the model organism for plants is called Arabidopsis thaliana. We just call it Arabidopsis for short. And it's a, it's a tiny plant. The genome has been completely sequenced. It's been used all over the world for all manner of types of experiments. And so why we chose it for growing in lunar regolith is both its size. It can grow just a teeny tiny thing. It can grow in a quarter teaspoon of material. It's also completely sequenced. There's a lot of reference material on growing it in other types of harsh environments and stress responses. And so we have a huge compendium of information that backs up all the stuff that we will find about uh, growing it in regular, as well as we've grown it in space uh, a number of times over the years. You know, Annalise, I'd never thought about it. Of course, you guys would want to do the same thing that sort of people who use laboratory animals do. Right, I, I looked. It's completely freaked me out. Opening up a catalog of mice, <laughs> you can, you can, you can short order mice that are identical to thousands of other mice that are distributed around the world, so that you, when you compare your research results, the full genome is identical, so that you can remove the variables and only look. You can remove things that you don't want to vary and look at the things that you do, and that's what you're doing with this seed. Isn't that correct? Yep. Exactly. That is, I love it. I love it. Now, did you guys create this? You know, it's, it's sequenced, but did anybody genetically create it or engineer it? We just found one that everybody just agreed would be good for this purpose. Yeah, for this particular experiment, we used uh, one of the, what is called a standard strain, one that is, um, as Annalisa described, very well characterized by thousands of laboratories on Earth for all kinds 
of environmental studies and developmental studies. So but the real question you, is, does it contract cancer like all species of mice do? <laughs> no matter, no matter what no matter. you feed them. <laughs> really, I've been working out, I've been exercising, I got cancer? Come on, right. Doc, you're <laughs> right. Every, every mouse ever studied in the lab gets cancer. Can I, from can whatever I just it say is. this? Or, oh, the Arapidopsis sounds, actually, it sounds like uh, on a, uh, as a, on the salad or men, uh, appetizer me menu of a, you'd find it like in a three star Michelin, you know, restaurant. It sounds delicious, but it's, you know, it's a veggie. Can you guys work on a plant that tastes like pizza, maybe? You know, something a little more fun or Krispy Kreme donut? That's you top know, secret. That's a top secret project in the back room. <laughs> they got so, a glazed donut, a powdered donut. So is this an hey. edible plant? Is it an edible plant? I mean, edible, is it, a, I'm following up on Paul's comment. Is this a seed and plant that we would consider eating or is it you just got to get any kind of plant working at all first? A little bit of both. So could you eat it? Yes. Have we eaten it? Oh, sure. Is it really tasty? Yeah, you know, it's just tastes like a green plant. It's uh, um, tastes like chicken. It, it just, does. You know, yeah. ah, it's right. <laughs> <laughs> Only the ones that we've engineered with chicken flavor. Yeah, yeah there, there you go. go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now you're talking. I want to go to space right now. <laughs> I want to go. But okay, so you have to. This is this is you have to crawl before you walk and walk before you run, right? You want to get any kind of. You want to get plants to do this at all. And that becomes the, the starting point. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. That's why we call it a model plant. Okay. And does it have any special, dare I call them talents, where it needs fewer nutrients relative to other plants? I mean, does it do better under stress conditions? You know, it, it's, I'm just wondering, uh, because you, you'd want to start broadening how much you stress the system, the plant, right? So that you can enclose as much of what goes on in space as possible. Well, I'd say the only talent that this, that this Arabidopsis has is that it's a member of the mustard family. And um, the mustard family is really plastic and resilient in all sorts of environments. I mean, think about all the different vegetables that you eat, everything from broccoli to Paul's favorite kale and uh, turnips, all these things are all <laughs> in the same family. Um, well, just to be clear, uh, you use the word plastic. Oh, <laughs> I meant yeah. it's malleable. Right? Thank you. You, Thank just, you. you yeah. just ruined every hot dog for me from now on, by the way. You ruined, every, you ruined my baseball games, my 4th of July cookout. No. You're using uh, the word plastic in its original definition, which gave it the name to the petroleum byproduct that, that it's called plastic, right? Pl the word plastic well pre said. predates plastic. <laughs> <laughs> and you're using right. it in the original term. Okay. So that's a good fact about the plant. And there, but there are stre and there is, but there are stresses within the, dif the different soil samples you use, right? Some have heavy metal and salt. Uh, some are more sensitive to drought, right? So, um, so you found different results based on the three different Apollo missions, the soil that you brought back, right? And that the older the soil, the less fruitful it was, right? So it doesn't matter what plant you're putting in it, right? You, you've got to, you've got to first somehow control that soil in some way and eliminate some of those stresses within the soil, regardless of the plant. Is that right? Yeah. So you're, you're hitting on what may well be one of the more fundamental things that, that we discovered as part of this project. Okay. Well then I think I'm done. If I did. Yeah, that, Paul, yeah. Just stop what's, there, Paul. I think, yeah, I'm no going to go have, I'm going to go have a hot dog with ketchup <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, stop so, all your head, Paul. <laughs> so very, very clearly what, what, what we found with these plants. Yeah. Is that they in some ways act as if they are stressed, but when, one of the one of the key things in, in terms of interpreting this, and I think Neil, this will appeal to you, is that this is an experience beyond the evolutionary experience of these particular organisms. And so, Paul, to interpret our results directly um, as equivalent to a terrestrial response that we know about might be right. It might be only partly right because, um, as Annalisa mentioned, they're reaching into their metabolic toolbox to deal with what they found. And what they found is quite literally brand new. It's out of their world. So, so we have a job ahead of us to help um, the world interpret what the plants are telling us 
Um, and it could be, yes, that they, ha they have to deal with heavy metals and other things that are different among different soils on the moon, yes. It could be there are other general things that they're dealing with simply because they're in a strange new environment. Does it matter what area of the moon the regolith comes from? Does it, do you get a different soil? Like, I mean, look, it's pretty obvious that uh, uh, Neil Armstrong got a got bump steered into lousy territory when he was drive when he was walking around the moon. They, oh, you know, just he... a, so a little known <laughs> fact, all right? They, the astronauts landed in the Maria, mm -hmm. which is very flat areas. In fact, Maria, which is Latin for seas, because at one point people thought that the wide, dark areas were were because they were flat, that they were bodies of water and before anyone really knew any physics or chemistry. But the reason why they landed there is because it was flat and they didn't want the lunar module to try to land on something that would end up tipping it over on some uh, un unfavorable terrain for mm. a horizontal landing. So mm. that was, it was a safety region, uh, reason mm. initially. Mm. If, the, if the soil that, that Armstrong brought back on 11 had been used earlier, I guess it just aged. It's not like wine. It goes the opposite. It doesn't age well, right? So if it had been, if it had been, whereas 17. Wait, 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 wait. Paul, she just said this stuff has been there a billion years. So what's 60 years going to do for anybody? What are you saying? Yeah, I, I, I you know, I, it, 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 it see, well, there's a difference between this dirt from 17 and the dirt from 11, right? In right. terms of its efficacy. So there must be something. Okay, to what that. is the difference? So what is the difference? Okay, so, so the difference is, is that the Apollo 11 materials were exposed to the solar wind for, and I'm not going to get the number exact, but say a billion years longer than the samples in Apollo 12, the Apollo 12 landing site. Right? And so in that billion years, as Neil said earlier, you don't have anything to weather it per se. You just keep accumulating the deposits from the solar wind, the, the heavy metals, the, the nanophase iron, the different things that make it also sharper and, and uh, more reactive surfaces and things. And so it just gets more and more to a plant hostile. And so is there a difference uh, among the sites? Absolutely. Is it something we can mitigate? Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's interesting. And just in case people didn't know, uh, you know, we take this phrase heavy metal for granted. But there are light metals. I don't know if anyone has ever thought about what the light metals mm. are. <laughs> there, such metals exist. Aluminum is a light metal, and it is light enough to have the density of rock. And we think of rocks as heavy, but aluminum having the density of rock means you'll find aluminum, at least on Earth, aluminum and rock in the same places because they settled out in the original molten Earth uh, having the same density. And so aluminum is like one of the most abundant elements in Earth's crust. So aluminum, titanium, um, sodium are all light metals. That's all. And there's never a light metal band, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, thought exactly. should be. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's called Barry Manilow. Why did volcanic ash, it, the, the, some of these plants did a lot better in volcanic ash, right? Oh, I like that, right. The, the moon has a, a fascinating volcanic history. And we know on Earth, volcanic regions, not initially because it kills everything, but then it becomes very fertile uh, 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 soil. So, so if we, in the future, might we target sort of volcanic plains, which, which many of these Maria are, but uh, is there anything we can learn from volcanic fertile places on Earth and, and apply that to these other planets? So Paul, were you also asking perhaps about the controls that we used? Mm -hmm. the volcanic materials that we used as a control. Mm -hmm. So we use this uh, material JSC-1A, which is a lunar simulant that, yes, is a type of volcanic ash. It's ground up basaltic material that's as similar as to the lunar materials that, that we could uh, that we could get JSC here. JSC stands for a Johnson Space Center, I bet. That is correct. Yeah, okay. Yep, yep, yep. So it's their own, it's their own sort of off-the-shelf uh, starter kit, I guess. Right, that, that right. Is. And yeah. Okay. It's a branding. Exactly. Good branding. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. But I guess what I'm asking is, the there are places on the moon that are less volcanic than others, and given that, that I've tasted many a wine from volcanic soils here on Earth, and the viticulture is extolled for its virtues, um, can, can we say that there's in the future we might target volcanic regions versus others? 
I think that would be what in growing food and growing wine on the moon would be one set of factors. Yes. They would ch choose the landing site. <laughs> I suspect that it wouldn't be the major driver for where we go to the well, moon. Well, I think you need to change your priorities then. <laughs> I think it should all be about the wine. The wine and, on the moon. Right. And we, and, and the moon, and, moon's and, already made of cheese, right? So the right, wine exactly. and cheese is... And legalized good. marijuana. I mean, if that, when that kicks in, I'm, I'm there. Um, so the regolith didn't do as well as the volcanic ash. That's the bottom line. But it did get a participation trophy. I just yeah, wanted to note yeah, that. So go. it kind of did well. But but can you take properties from the volcanic ash and factor it into the regolith? Maybe you can, maybe you can't, right? Sure. So the uh, the terrestrial volcanic ash uh, is, and again, both the, 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 the lunar materials and the, the simulant are both essentially ground up basalts. And so they have the fundamental characteristics of each other. But the whereas the, the material from Earth is more rounded. It's it's less reactive. It has less surface area. It's less sharp. Um, you did use that word sharp. I, I hadn't fully appreciated mm -hmm. that the texture of something matters greatly in terms of the interaction of it and its surroundings. Right. right. I mean, think yeah. of the difference between a uh, sea glass and something you dropped on your kitchen tile the same day. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, you can walk on sea glass, right? It's basically smooth pebbles, right? Right. So. Uh, well, you could walk on your freshly broken glass, but you'll cut yourself. <laughs> That's <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. Let me let me ask a question that will surely blend into our third segment. There's not enough talked about. I mean, in in people who think about this know about it, but in the public, the fact that you know an ant can walk straight to a wall and then just walk up the wall, right? And we can't do that. And an ant could get trapped in a small bubble of water and because of the surface tension of the water and all i'm saying is that for small things gravity as we experience it becomes less and less and less important to their lives and so you have plants growing in zero g on the international space station and you study its molecular uh, changes properties of genetic code why should zero G have any effect on it at all when it's at the molecular level? And why do molecules give a rat's ass about gravity? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> and and it's really not whether the molecule cares, it's whether the organism cares. Right. Oh, the fuller organism. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So do plants care whether there's gravity or not? That's a big question. Well, they do grow up instead of down. So maybe, <laughs> maybe not, so. Not uh, mine. Not mine. They, yeah. they, they, Yours just they, don't grow. That's no, a different they just, problem. Uh, you know, um, it's it's really all about cues, right? It's all about directional cues. And so on Earth, plants have evolved to use gravity. So the roots grow down, the shoots grow up. But wait, how do you wait, 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 wait. How do you know the 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 shoots grow up against gravity rather than towards sunlight? They do both, actually. Okay, so well, let's hold that. Let's hold that. We're gonna take a quick break and when it okay. come back. We're going to get into sort of the molecular physics of these plants and what forces of nature do they care about most and what do they just not care about at all. On Star Talk, we're talking about growing plants in space, not only in orbit, but on planetary bodies when we return. We're back, Star Talk, talking about growing plants in space in orbit, Planetary bodies. I got Paul Mercurio with me. Paul, how do we find you on social media? Plus, you've got a podcast, don't you? Yeah, it's uh, called Inside Out with Paul Mercurio. You've been on it. Uh, Your name time. is in the podcast. <laughs> My okay. name is so. in the podcast. Just only so I remember whose it is. Because <laughs> I have a thing. Uh, yes, uh, so you can get it wherever the millions and billions of podcasts are sold, as they say. And uh, <laughs> at Paul Mercurio, this is where you get it. At uh, Paul Mercurio. At, okay. Yeah, M E. Yeah. M-E-C-U-R-I-O. -E if you do M-E-R-C-U-R-I-O, there's an Australian actor who has a really, he wears tight pants. That's not me. So okay. that's, that's okay. Uh, so and, and we have with us, of course, uh, Annalisa Paul and Robert Furl, both on the faculty at the University of Florida, specializing in horticulture with sides of interest that uh, help us figure out how you're going to grow plants in space, possibly to eat them one day. And how can we find you guys? Uh, how can the public find what you, you guys do? Well, we have a, a laboratory website called UF Space Plants. And if you were to 
just Google that. You'd, you'd come up with us, I suppose. Nice. So UF as <laughs> University of Florida. Uh, yes, space correct. Plants. And space plants. I just love that pairing of those two words. It just sounds great. I love it. We heard of space aliens, but space plants, right. you know. <laughs> uh, by the way, I have on good authority. Uh, I don't know if you knew this. Uh, I, I couldn't imagine I could tell the two of you something you didn't know in advance, but I bet this is one of them. That E.T., E.T. from the movie E.T. was conceived as a sentient plant. Hmm. Cool. Did that's not why, know that. That's why E.T. had that glowing finger and he'd come near the plants and the plants would rejuvenate. Do you remember this from the movie? Yeah, yeah, was, yeah. So ET was a vegetable, not an animal. Just thought I'd tell you that. I, I knew you you would dine and learn something like that today. <laughs> I like it. Glad to know it. Yeah. <laughs> Surprising uh, the kid liked it if it was a vegetable. It was that's a strange combination. Oh, usually, kids, yeah. usually kids don't like vegetables. They don't Can befriend. I just ask that these two great scientists, uh, the Aridopsis, which is you know the basis for your research. What is the best vinaigrette to go with that? Have you done that <laughs> research yet? And where are we on that? That's, right. that's a very important question for the astronauts. I think. Actually, Johnson Space Center has a food lab where they, uh, they, they combine flavors that have a good enough shelf life for long-term space missions. May so... I suggest a little avocado vinaigrette? That's just my <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> Perfect. You know, the hint of sweetness will make all the difference. You got it. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so tell me, tell me again about... Uh, how do you know that the plant is reaching up against gravity rather than reaching up towards sunlight? Because wasn't it for a long while, didn't we think that plants turned towards the sun because they wanted sunlight? But in fact, sunlight was killing some chemical in their, in their, on the side of the, of the branch that it ended up curling towards it. And it was just a side effect that the leaves faced the sun. Isn't that what, isn't that what's actually going on inside the plant? This is precisely what is going on. So that's actually very well said. It's not that uh, they're, they're, but they are doing that. They are reaching towards the sun, but they do that by, because they've evolved such that when you have too much sun, what it does is it makes the other side of the cell elongate more. And so as it elongates, it causes it to curve. The same thing happens with, in the, for, for gravity sensing, the plants are growing down on earth but if you say if you take a plant to to an environment that has no gravity, you lose the gravity cue, and so you still have to rely on light for that cue. Plants yeah, but if you have a seed, if, light. if you have a seed embedded in a blob of soil and you're in zero g, and then you water it, however you do that because there's no gravity. But okay, you get water in the soil, however you do it magically. How what, how does the seed know which, know which way to open and then pop out of your blob of soil? So we've done this experiment essentially. Um, we've done that. It's that the blob becomes auger on a plate. It comes closed in the light. We've done them in the dark. The plant has an inherent mechanism on how to grow away from where it's planted. Because if it didn't, it would just grow in this little tight blob, and then it would use up all the nutrients right around it, and it would die. Oh, and so, and so it okay. has an inherent mechanism to elongate and make this sort of a coil kind of uh, growth pattern that takes it away from its planted. This the the roots just coil away, the shoots coil away in the other direction, and eventually you get something that looks more or less like a plant, even when you grow them in the dark. But if you grow them in the light, then plants without gravity use light as a cue. The plant's roots grow away from that light, and the plant shoots grow towards that light, even without gravity. Or at least away from which way the shoot is going, because if you're in the soil, you won't see the light at all. I That's true. Right, yep. right. So how about all these people I see growing plants, I get, what is it called, hydroponic? Growing mm -hmm. plants just in a pot of water. Uh, why can't you just do that in space? Well, in fact, you, you can, one can. And one of the sort of major engineering thrusts of plant growth in space is try to understand how to manage water in zero gravity because um, in the absence of gravity, capillary action takes over and you get blobs of water attached to your roots. And so you can essentially drown your roots with very little water mm. um, in space simply because gravity is not pulling the water away. So there is, there's a lot of biology and water management that is on earth dependent upon gravity, especially for hydroponics or things related to that. So so yeah, water management is a big deal. And would that be a way, a non-soil way to grow plants in space for life support? Yeah, absolutely. 
Okay, what, but then you have to still feed it nutrients, right? Uh, in the, sure. It'd have to be nutrient-rich water. Can't yep. be distilled water. Yeah, right? and that's called oh, miracle uh, grow, Neil. Miracle Everybody grow. knows that. <laughs> Everybody, st- do you stupid seriously, me. Sorry. Just between the four of us, do you guys cheat a little bit and throw a little miracle grow in when you're doing these ah. experiments? <laughs> just to <laughs> see. <laughs> I look at Rob. He's not yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Absolutely. Uh, this is yeah. breaking news, everybody. We breaking just breaking news. <laughs> so, what about light and the you know the light that these plants need and will need? I know there is going to be controlled environments in space, but right? I mean, how, it, have you experimented with different types of lighting that these different plants need? Dude, have is you never depend- grown marijuana? You just get a grow light. What like what kind of question is that? What's, <laughs> yeah. what's the- <laughs> I haven't, but I know somebody on this in this meeting that has in this conversation. No, initially, <laughs> just in all fairness to that question, when I first thought about the problem, I said, if you're going to travel to the outer solar system, the sun gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. So you can't rely on sunlight. And I was imagining you couldn't grow plants, but of course you can. You just have some other grow lamp, right? Well, so Paul, again, potentially by pure mistake or random error, landed on a very, very <laughs> fundamental. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That so was imper- a very passive aggressive compliment. <laughs> are, are you the vice president of passive aggressive compliments yeah, at the exactly. University of Florida? I'm not, I got stuff. I read. I wrote stuff. Right, okay, go ahead. And, it, and it's showing up. Can we, you say that okay. again? That I did. A, I asked a good question so I could record this and tell my wife that I asked a smart question. But anyway, okay. go ahead. So, so here's here's the real deal. The the question of how you would get lights to your plants on another planetary surface um, is a very fair one because you have to trade off the cost of generating the energy for lighting up the LEDs against the cost of building, for example, a light collector and a translucent tube to bring that light to your growth surface. Which or would then be a passive, would be... Energy right. passive exactly. for you, yeah, yeah. Plus, yeah. you've got to factor in use of electricity for the disco ball every Saturday night <laughs> when you're having your disco party on the moon. All of this, all of the above. All of this has to be sure. factored in. Yes, yeah. Yeah, but continue, sir. No, no, no. The, it, we, that's basically it. The whole idea of how you manage light um, as you transit around the solar system um, or whether you dig underground and use nuclear power with your LEDs or whether you pipe light in from the surface. These are all, this is the stuff of science fiction, but it's it becoming science fact and reality as we think about what a habitat on the moon might look like. Do we want natural sunlight? How do we collect it? And how do you pipe it down into where you're going to live, whether you're a person or a plant? Okay, so here's the $900 question. Will all future astronauts have to be vegetarians? Or is there some way you're going to also uh, sustain animal life out there that would then be edible? I guess chickens or something. I mean, is there is there a... a it's, who's thinking about this? Yeah. NASA's actually thinking a lot about this. Um, the, the problem is, is that the best animal protein sources are not commonly utilized in Western cooking, things like mealworms, um, mm, you know, yum, yum, and, yum. And, and insects in general, I guess. <laughs> right. Are high yeah. protein. Exactly. Right. Right. Exactly. Yep. And right. Is there, is there a way to make sure that any of these astronauts who are vegetarians have the gene taken out of them where they lecture you about how <laughs> great being a vegetarian <laughs> is? Can you guys work on that, please? I'm sure I'll give you more of, of the my, questionnaires. Yeah. I'll give you more of my light information and my brilliant lighting questions but please we can all work on that <laughs> brilliant like it but, but, yes. the, you, I, but otherwise there's uh you know what you haven't talked about is fungus right uh, fungus i mean mushrooms are, are 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 occasionally described as being meaty maybe that would be the compromise between a pure vegetarian diet and one that um would involve meat yep. because and- portobello mushrooms taste meaty Mm. Do but they it also uh, helps with this concept of what do you do with all the biomass that you can't eat directly? And so you need something to help break that down. And so you're right, funguses could do that. And let's so, not forget about psychedelic mushrooms. I'm just putting it out there. Okay. I'm just, I'm just, it's, it's in it, case it, being in space is not enough for you. Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is all right. But I really like, this is a trip, but I'd really like to be tripping right now. <laughs> In the end, we will be traveling, whether we wanted to by design or not, we'll be traveling with microbes, 
um, fungi and mm -hmm. probably intentionally with plants, but we will have a, an ecosystem of some sorts, wherever it is we're living. Um, so back to your question about fungi, when would they be part of the ecosystem that does remove, um, that does do some composting, if you will, in space as part of the life support system? Yeah, very likely. And, and Paul, you can tell Rob is VP because they, he's, once again, he said it very tactfully. Uh, uh, let me tell you what he didn't say, which is what he actually said, right? There is fungus growing on our skin <laughs> and all over our bodies that we're taking it to space no matter what. Thanks. Okay. Dude, now I, I have to take a shower after this show. <laughs> wait, wait, Rob, am I correct? You left, you didn't say that. But you know you, that's what uh, you meant. You, you are, of course, absolutely correct. There's no <laughs> way we are sterilizing our skins and our innards when we're traveling anywhere. And I any love Rob because he says really scary stuff <laughs> that it doesn't sound scary at all. You know, that was kind of a good question, you dummy, like that kind of stuff. I just love this. I uh, Thank you. I'm going to have to have an extra therapy session this week, Rob. I appreciate it. Very good. So let me ask you this real quick about Apollo 11, the regular from that versus 12 and 17, 12 and 17. 17, you, it, it gave you better uh, plants, if you will, or whatever. So would that be like, to put it in layman's terms, so that with the food generated by the Apollo 11 regular versus the 12 and 17, 12 and 17 would be like food sold at Whole Foods, way above what it should be costing. And then the Apollo 11 stuff would be sold at like Costco. Is that kind of how this would work? <laughs> if there were a Costco and a please Whole don't, Foods- don't, Please don't answer yes to that. <laughs> 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 Uh, that just took away from my light question. That like no, 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 <laughs> yeah. But but in in all fairness, one of the real questions would be: Does it taste differently if it's grown in different different soils? Uh -huh. Aha! Yeah, another point. good question. And actually, go. that's brilliant. That's right, because wine picks up some of that flavor. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, well, let me let me catapult this because I'm done with Apollo in this conversation. Let's let's go straight to poop potatoes, which were famously <laughs> grown on the surface of Mars during the movie, The Martian. So first, question one, how good is human feces as a fertilizer relative to like cow poop? Second- Oh, I can answer that. No, could he, it's, how realistic is that? Because by the way, professionally uh, in the, in the storyline, Matt Damon's character was a botanist. So he's supposed to be all up in how that's supposed to work. And so uh, can you comment on the, 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 the efficacy of his actions in that film? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by saying, first off, there, there is almost never in the history of movie making where the botanist is the space hero. So let's just celebrate that. <laughs> <laughs> and by the exactly way, exactly what it is. I got raked over the coals in Twitter. I think I said something like, um, it seems to me it would be easier for the engineer to know as much engineering as he did to pick up some botany on the side than for the botanist to know all the engineering that he did. So, and then the, the botanist just, just <laughs> wrecked. Cause you're right. The, 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 Cause we have engineering heroes in science all, all the time. I should have backed up and given the botanist the day in the sun. So I Can you yep. just let us have our escapism for two hours? I, I, <laughs> I, I did the same with the movie Arrival. The movie Arrival, we want to talk to aliens and they got a linguist and a physicist. It's like, no, get a, get a, get a, a, a cryptographer and an astrobiologist. Oh. And you then all the linguists him. jumped yeah, all yeah. over me. Well, yeah. yeah, well, you should hear him go off on Mary Poppins. No one can fly with an umbrella. Like, no, that is not to, 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 <laughs> really? Right. Let me see so, the introduction so to my I nanny. Can, I will concede the we have a, a hero botanist. Okay. So now let's get back to the poop potatoes. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in on this one. First of all, I am happy to say neither Rob nor I are experts in poop. So uh, Okay. <laughs> That's a separate <laughs> profession. That's a separate sub profession right. of what you guys uh, do. Okay. However, I will say that. The, uh, the Martian regolith, as far as we know, from lander studies and stuff, not as far as we know, but as far as you know, like scientists know, is full of things like perchlorates, for instance. Toxic stuff, plants hate it, so do humans. And if you have perchlorate-type soils here on Earth, what do you do? 
you mix it with water and you mix it with organic materials to help mitigate the toxicity of that. So just saying, Matt Damon was close. Okay, so so he had the 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 uh, hermetically sealed poop of everyone, <laughs> and which meant whatever was anaerobic was still happy, still in there, I presume, right? And because your lower gut is all anaerobic, right? So, but his poop wasn't representative of poop in general because it was all based on just eating potatoes and and w- whatever that pill he was grinding up. So h- h- you can't. No, no, sit- he didn't use his own poop. He used the poop in the trash left by his crew of all the days they had spent there. Oh, don't so you remember? Was, and he cut oh, open the right. packet and he right. said, so there were like hey, Big Macs Dude, Freddie, what were you eating that day? Yeah, you know, the, and, uh, okay. right, Big Macs and Juju, you know, and like, yeah. Right, right, right. Like Snickers oh. bars, got it, okay. Okay, so there is some, so some he, sci-fi yeah. authenticity to that, to that Absolutely. approach. Absolutely, and we do, we do have to answer the question. Human poop, yes, is perfectly good for fertilizer. <laughs> so why don't we all just poop into our house plants? <laughs> I have. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> no, i have done that experiment. I was not intentionally. I was drunk. But you know what? Good things come from drinking. What can I tell you? Hey, speaking of Martian, Neil, what? when they do the sequel, who is going to play? Who are we going to cast to play Annalisa? And who is going to play Rob? We oh, mean in the sequel to The Martian? Yes, oh, my God. They're going to be. They're going to be the heroes. Okay. I'm friends with Andy Weir. I'll put him on top of this okay. podcast. So yeah. I think for Annalisa, we should do Sandra Bullock. Oh, Perfect. who's going to play them? The characters. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. And for, and for Rob, uh, how about because he's so passive aggressive, Christopher Walken? How about yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Deal. Done. We we've yeah, got. Okay, it. So that's all done. So call Andy in. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> is he? So what if what if you're going to a place like Venus where it's 800 degrees? Is this at all? There's, none of this is feasible. No. I that's mean, the end. Of, oh, that, there's, end of story. Right, right. End I mean, of story. Well, you can right. grow eggplant, then you put some cheese on it, you instantly have eggplant parmesan, I guess. What? That's about yeah, it. Yeah, very, right? very instantly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just just for, for context, a pizza oven is 500 degrees, and the surface of Venus is 900 degrees. So, uh, and I did the calculation. You could cook a pizza in seven seconds on the windowsill. And then some, I got out geeked, and someone said, no, you left out the radiative energy from the atmosphere itself, so it'll cook in three seconds. Uh-huh. So, yeah. So I so no our esteemed guests today are not thinking about plants on Venus. But Mars, right? Is this is this is all building sure. to Mars, right? Hopefully, why not? This could be used. Yeah. This could be used in Mars. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And also, food food scarce areas on Earth as well is another is another. Yeah, I want to just thing. end on the thought. Can either of each of you just briefly comment? Um, surely, we're going to learn things from your work that will help us produce food here on earth in places that either previously were not arable or where are arable but now we can improve on what their their uh yield is or productivity or nutrition surely there's some overlap here is that not right uh, absolutely one of the things that that this work does is it probes the edges of the adaptability of plants in there it is. various difficult spots it happens to be an extraterrestrially difficult spot but the analogy is the same. Yeah, there you go. And uh, Mars is drier than the Sahara. So if you grow something on Mars, we can do it in the Sahara. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Guys, we got to end it there. This has been fun and illuminating. And uh, I, I think, you know, when you guys have, uh, when you can grow a, uh, what, an apple tree, give me a call. We'll b- bring you back on. <laughs> and All right. We'll, we'll talk about it. I, apple trees, I, think of, I think of Isaac Newton and apple trees, but, uh, you know, fruit and other things more interesting than kale are, would be a must. Otherwise, I'm staying here on Earth. Just so I'm with you. Or, you know, the Krispy Kreme donut. I'm going to go back to that. If you really are good at what you do, you would figure that out. I'm just well, engineered you know, in. Yeah, you can, you can live for <laughs> centuries off of Krispy Kreme donuts. Oh, the, God. The, yeah. the energy content is... You can power missiles. It's like a, it's like a Twinkie, you know? It's like the, it's a thousand year half life. And when you guys walk to do, you know, the, when you do the uh, celebrity walk for the premiere of Martian 2, I, we would, I would like to be with the two of you as, you know, because they're going to be have stars playing you in the movie. So I'd like okay. to be there for that. Awesome. <laughs> All are. right. A- Annalisa Paul and Rob Furl, delight to have you for the first time on Star Talk. And maybe it won't be the last. 
Uh, and Paul, this will be your last time. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, what? you were brilliant here, Paul. You would like all in. I, I love you, man. Love uh, you, man. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. As always, keep looking up.